In the mid-50s, two actresses then known as Sarah Buckner and Yvonne Lime met on the set of The Adventures of Ozzie and Harriet. The young stars soon found themselves singing their way through Southeast Asia on a USO tour. Little did they know that that trip would be the beginning of a journey that continues today. It was October 1959. The remnants of a typhoon was bearing down on the island of Japan, but the two ladies ventured out into the street and saw a sight that hurt them to their cores. There, in the rain, the wind, and the cold, were huddled 11 unwanted children, cast-offs with no home and no caring parents to look after them. Sarah and Yvonne offered the warmth of their coats to the children, then took them back to their hotel for food and shelter. But what now? Sarah and Yvonne decided the only thing they could do was to start an orphanage. It would be one of five orphanages the two would eventually build, plus a hospital and a school, all spearheaded by Sarah and Yvonne with dedicated Marine Corps partners and funded with the help of the generosity of their friends and film contacts back home. In 1975, the fall of Saigon was imminent. Word reached Sarah and Yvonne that thousands of orphaned children from South Vietnam were in harm's way. And so began Operation Babylift. Into the waiting, welcoming arms of new parents went over 2,000 children. Witnessing their life-saving efforts, the First Lady of California at the time, Nancy Reagan, implored Sarah and Yvonne to lend their talents here at home to what she called America's best kept secret, child abuse and neglect. In 1976, the first of a number of residential facilities was opened, each designed to give abused and neglected children a protective, nurturing environment, a place to be safe. In the 1980s, Children's Village USA implemented the first national toll-free hotline, 1-800-FOR-A-CHILD. In 1983, a name change, Child Help. With the national hotline and other initiatives, Child Help was now truly a national organization, one that could offer help to abused children nationwide. Child Help would go on to open group homes in California to give children transitioning to foster care a protective place to find support and safety. In the early 90s, saw it is turned, and a new 270-acre residential center, the Alice C. Tyler Village of Child Help East, soon offers programs for the treatment of abused and neglected children there. Child advocacy centers in Tennessee and Arizona would follow. Educational programs, such as Speak Up and Be Safe, would signal the start of Child Help's new initiatives on the prevention of abuse and neglect. In 2000, Merv Griffin donates his sprawling dude ranch to the cause. More child advocacy centers would open, plus foster care programs, abuse prevention education initiatives, and much more. And all the while, Sarah O'Meara and Yvonne Federson would receive not only the admiration of their peers, but honorary university doctorates, countless awards and accolades, and impressively, nine Nobel Peace Prize nominations. Today, we commemorate their Diamond Jubilee, and we celebrate an amazing journey that has changed the lives of over 10 million children for the better. The path that Sarah and Yvonne started on 60 years ago has led to Child Help becoming the largest nonprofit organization in the world that is dedicated to helping at risk children and victims of child abuse and neglect. What began as a simple act of kindness has transformed into an organization offering hope and inspiration to millions. Good morning, this is Reverend Cheryl Guest from the Center for Spiritual Living in Palm Desert. 
Today, I have a really great interview for you. It's with Judy Jensen. She is the... I'm the director of the Western Region for Chapters of Child Health. And I know that a lot of people that go to our center have been involved with child health and helping out at the Christmas program and donating different things or their time in order to help out this charity. And several people from our center are part of this. Also, right. uh, Lori Hewling, uh, Barbara Benson, um, uh, uh, Leanne. Leanne Erickson, and uh, what's his name? Oh, uh, Brian, Brian and, and Sheila and Housley. Sheila Housley, yeah. So a lot of people from our center are actually involved with this charity. And I just think that they do some wonderful work. I'm also involved with it as well. <laughs> Forgot to mention that. You do a that. great job. Thank you. I'm the a chaplain for child health. Yes. So anyway, um, we're just going to have a few questions for Judy. You just got through seeing the clip of what child help was about and how it was founded by, um, let me see. Sarah O'Meara and Yvonne Federson. Thank you. See, we're playing off each other just perfectly. This is going to work great. <laughs> okay. So, Judy, I just wanted to start with a little brief background on, you know, how you got into this. So, what, what got you into child help? How did you end up working for them? Well, I met Sarah O'Meara in Aspen, Colorado, oh, probably 1998. And then when I moved to Arizona, I started going. They have a chapel on the grounds of their home, and they have a chapel service once a month. And I, it's called the Little Chapel, and I started going to their services, and of course, Sarah, being the founder of Child Help, brings in what their work is with abused and neglected children. So the more I got to know them, and then I started traveling with them to different functions, like to D.C. for our National Day of Hope, or Tennessee, or and just as a volunteer. Um, and the more I got involved, the more I realized that I was getting more and more passionate about it. I was in real estate for 34 years and in Hawaii and Aspen, Colorado, and then eventually Arizona, but I, I was really just doing it for the money. I no longer was excited about it, but I was getting very passionate about what Sarah and Yvonne were doing with these children. So one day I just asked them, I said, you know, you don't by any chance have a job, do you? And they said, well, we, we have a job opening. We don't know if you'll like it or you'll be good at it, but why don't you go interview? So I did, and that's now 14 years later. I'm still doing it, yeah. and the days fly by because what we do is so important for these precious children, and not just in California, but nationwide and in other countries too. So I, I have children and grandchildren and I love them so dearly and I just can't imagine people hurting precious children. Absolutely. So. Absolutely. So um, Child Help is uh, here in the desert. It's an Indian Wells chapter and it's a smaller chapter but we seem to be mighty. mighty. Yes. We are mighty because we do raise a lot of money for the organization yeah. and for um, and we also do a lot for the, the local uh, foster care home that's out in Banning. So yes. um, if you could tell me, um, what are some of the different um, programs that Child Help has that they offer? I mean, I know some of them are nationwide, some of them are local, and right. some of them are both. So right. which, ones, what do you, which ones do you want to talk about today? <laughs> well, we, um, we focus on intervention, prevention, and treatment. So in California, we have the Child Help Work Ribbon Village, which is a residential treatment facility for children who are the most severely abused. They're wards of the court, and they've been placed in maybe 10 to 12 or even more um, foster care uh, situations. And because of their abuse, they need specialized treatment. So they are sent to our village. Um, our village is a level 12, there is no 13, and level 14 is locked down and medicated. And we're licensed at our village uh, ages 6 to 14, so you can imagine you don't need to medicate and lock up children. Right. They just need treatment. Um, we do have foster care and adoption. We have our Child Help National um, Child Abuse Hotline. We have uh, our two residential villages, one here in California and one in Virginia. And then we have advocacy centers in Tennessee and Arizona. And um, 
we have also group homes in California, which are in Orange County. So you're really all over the place. We aren't you? are. Yes, we have a lot of programs, and a lot of times people want us to do more, but we're because we're so specialized, we want to be the best at what we're already doing and not spread ourselves too thin. We also have our prevention education program, which is Child Up, Speak Up, Be Safe. Um, and that program last year served over 140,000 children in 25 states and 13 countries. So, so Speak Up and Be Safe is a way to teach a child to know when something that's happening is inappropriate and what to say or what to do you know because a lot of times when these things happen especially a young child they have no idea especially if it's a parent exactly. or a relative that's causing the abuse whatever it is right. and so it's really nice that you have this thing and i know that y'all always give out backpacks or yes. something and those little wrist rings that say 1-800 child yes. help and that's for the hotline right, right. but the right. hotline isn't just for kids i mean there are adults that i mean parents they call it as well? Yes. It, the, our National Child Abuse Hotline is for, it could be someone who suspects child abuse of a neighbor or a grandchild. It could be a child. It could be a parent that's even stressed out and they know they're about ready to do something to their child that they shouldn't out of anger or stress or frustration. So they call our hotline. Our hotline is 24-7. And um, it's in a hundred and I think 24 languages. And so that's a resource for people to reach out to. And, and then they direct them to different resources in their area to help them. Mm -hmm. um, so it's this year with the pandemic, our text and chat and calls have gone up 43% because before the children could reach out to their counselors in the school or their teachers. Um, but now they're at home, and sometimes at home is where they're abused. Right. And so they have no escape. But our hotline number, if we can get it out, then the child at least can call, or if they can't call, they can text, because a lot of the children would rather text than have someone near them talking on the phone. So it's really important, and it's an unfortunate situation. I mean, we're one of the few companies and charities that we wish we weren't in business. But unfortunately, the the um, abuse and neglect is going up and not down. Right. So, so we provide this service to as many children as we can, and that's why we fundraise so that we can provide the services to more children throughout the country and um, and also get the hotline out. That's really important because and our Speak Up Be Safe program too, because that's how you end the cycles when the children know the difference of what is happening to them and what is abuse and to tell someone. The most important thing is for the children to tell because it's mandatory for teachers or counselors or nurses or it's mandatory ministers. for their ministers. <laughs> it's mandatory for them to report and that's right. how you stop the cycle. Right. And I, that, that seems to make a lot of sense. Yeah. So during the um, pandemic, um, so many kids are not in school now. Do you think that that might be possibly because the parents now are 24 seven with their kids and being in school, sometimes it helped just give them enough of a break to not go to that frustration level. Exactly. Yeah. And even over New Year's, I was watching some of the clips from last year and there were parents who are not abusive parents, but they were just, you know, they had a lot of stress on them because they're trying to, be online with the children with their lessons. They're trying to do their own work. Um, sometimes they're out of work and they don't have the finances they had. And so they had some clips of parents just going, I, I'm about ready to reach my limit right here. You know, not that they necessarily were gonna reach out and be abusive, but just the, the stress. Right. Um, so most, you know, it was really interesting when I was in college, I had a, a a lifetime development class and so it used to be called child development class and it was to um but now they're looking at over the lifetime of a person you know the different phases of the life and stuff but one of the things that uh this teacher did the first day i was there she said is it ever okay to spank your child and i said no 
<laughs> Absolutely not. I never ever spanked right. my kids. Right. I just I never did. Either. I just didn't think. I mean, it's so disrespectful, and it's just. And so one, um, I remember one man in the class. He he said, um, well, just sometimes he just needs a spanking because that's the only way I can get his attention. And so at the end of everybody putting in their feedback and everything, they, she said, no, it is never okay to spank your child because what you do is they stop trusting you and they stop respecting you. Mm -hmm. And then when you start abusing a child is when they'll start lying to you mm -hmm. or whenever you're, you know, and you're doing something that is like, you know, and then what you also teach them is what she said too, is that you teach them when somebody frustrates you or gets you angry, it's okay to hit them, mm -hmm. you know? And I think that that's part of the, what goes on, you know? And so you just reach this point where you that you have the abused becoming the abusers. Exactly. And yes. so we've seen that a lot in different, you know, places and different times, and, you know, it's not, um, and the other thing that's interesting, it's not a socioeconomic no, situation. No, no, You'll see, there's, it's, it has nothing to do with economics or race or anything. It's all across the spectrum. And, and as far as um, parenting, I think a lot of times parents strike out out of their own frustration or even fear sometimes, like a child ran out toward the street and so they want to teach them not to do that. But it's, it's, it shouldn't be out of out of fear or frustration. It should be that that you're teaching a child how to deal with situations in life so that they're more careful or or you know don't walk up to cars and talk to strangers or don't run off in a in a store where you can't see your parent or your guardian or whoever's with you because in a split second they can be gone. Exactly. And so it's trying to emphasize in a positive way the 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 lessons that will keep them safe that's the main thing exactly yeah and making the child aware seems to make it a lot better because they then can say this is not right and this is not how it is everywhere because as a child you know you think back to being a child yourself that you realize that um you knew at certain times that this didn't feel right, right, but you weren't certain, you know? So it's just to reinforce that. And that's right. why I really like our Speak Up and Be Safe. Yes. Now, on the um, the kids that are at our village, uh -huh. when you say, um, I just remember that we went to CPK one time. We took, we right. did a, a, we took them out on a field trip. Right. And it was great. And I remember I was, uh, because you have to be extremely careful when you're uh, with kids, you can't take pictures of their faces. Correct. Like you can't put them out on the internet. And so uh, I was just taking pictures above the table. They were making their little pizzas. Right. It was so adorable. And then I got home and one of the little girls that was patting had cigarette burn scars on her hand. And I was just like, oh my God, yeah. tore me up. Exactly. You know, you just don't realize what, pe and this was like a five or six year old. And you know, what are people thinking? You know, oh, but it's, it's so sad that the stories of these children and what they've gone through and yet, if you go to our village, I mean, you'll see some of the children still um, have the facial expressions and everything that show that they've been through something very traumatic. But a lot of times the children, their eyes are bright, they're smiling, they're having fun at the, like the holiday parties or Easter or whatever the event is at the village because Sarah and Yvonne their foundation was is all who enter here will find love and that's what they want it's not like an institutional mm -hmm. village at all it's all the bedrooms are decorated mostly by the chapters they mm -hmm. all go out and, and buy the bedding and the curtains and everything so that these children have a, a very child-friendly atmosphere um, they they eat their meals together in the cottages I think lunch they go down to the cafeteria and have, but we also have a, a non-public school at our village where the children can go to school because sometimes they're behind in their um, their learning abilities and things. So we we do work with them so that when they leave our village, they can go to a group home and be up to date with where they should be for their appropriate grade. But it's a lot of work and these children need a lot of care. We have staff there 24 seven with the children. Um, 
Each child gets a brand new bike when they come to the village. The girls get an American Girl doll. And these are all through donations mm -hmm. from our volunteers and our chapters um, because none of this is provided for by the county and the right. state. So basic, basically, it is a, um, it is a state uh, certified and everything, this yes, particular. Yes. But what we do is, so they do get a certain X amount of dollars yes, for each child that is placed there. Yes. But what we do at our chapter is we make it fun for them, right. in a way. And you provide things for the children that the state does not and the county does not provide for them. Um, whether it's excursions, like we have some chapters that take the children, um, we have a group called the Eagles and they take the children with John Stamos to Universal Studios and things oh. like that, or, or basketball games. I mean, this is pre-COVID, but, but they, these children, some of them have never even had a doll. Some of them, I remember one woman who's a special friend saying she took her, child, her special friend to, um, out to dinner and, and that child had never been to a restaurant in his life. And so the, the simple things that our children get normally, um, these, children haven't, yeah, these children haven't had that experience. So they really do, it, it is a happy memory when they're at our village, even though they're separated from their parents or their grandparents or their environment, but they come back later and tell us that that was the happiest time of their childhood because they can be children, they know they're safe, they know what to expect. Um, they all have they all have rules that they follow. They get an allowance, and they can do with their allowance what they want. Um, we have a chapel on the on the, at, on the grounds of each village, and so it's non denominational. But whatever denomination or whatever background they came from, we make sure that that is provided for them, and so they get the spiritual growth while they're there too. Um, we have um, different programs for the children as far as uh, going on hikes, wilderness. We have art therapy. We have okay. animal therapy. Mm -hmm. We have this is the child that we're given villages on 123 acres of land, and it was we it was established in 1978. So it's been there a long time, and so the children many times when they come to our village they won't open up to an adult, but they will start grooming our horses or playing with the animals and they'll start opening up little by little so that by within a short amount of time, usually then they will at least talk to an adult, whereas right. they wouldn't before. So right. we have a lot of extra therapies that help these children. And I know we have um, psycho psychologists on staff. Yeah, oh yes. Yeah. They, I mean, this Counselors, is a complete, yeah. everything that you need to help this child is right there. Exactly. And it's, it's available to them. Yes. And so um, when we raise, uh, I know that you do a lot of the big events and, you know, around, but um, we raise money for the national as well as for our local chapter. Yes. Here we have, at the local chapter, we have what we call our love jar. Yes. Now, if you put the money in the love jar, it stays locally, right. you know, and then we can help our banning yeah. kids, you know. Right. But if we, but Beaumont. then, Beaumont. So, Beaumont kids, yeah. I'm sorry, I keep saying <laughs> banning, it's Beaumont. Yeah, yes. I knew it was one of those B words, right? right? right. But <laughs> anyway, they, um, the kids, though, the other money that we raise, like we have one great big giant event. I'd love you talk for you to talk sure. about that one. That was pretty cool. Yes. Well, the chapter, each of the chapters put on events in their areas. And so what the chapters do is they're not only fundraising for child help nationally, but there also are um, voices in their communities. So they get the word out because even though child health has been around since 1959, we uh, don't have the funds to advertise on TV like say other charities do where you get such national exposure that people know about you. So our chapters are the way that help us a lot um, with fundraising. So here locally, the Indian Wells chapter, they do a golf tournament every year and We've been so fortunate that Larry Ellison has donated Porcupine Creek to us each year, which is part of his personal residence. Um, it's not a country club. It's not open to the public. No one can play on it unless you're invited. 
And for 10 years now, he's been donating this to us. And so golfers come in from all over the country and the Indian Wells chapter helps put on this golf tournament. This year, it was actually a two day tournament, which we were so fortunate to also have um, Andalusia Country Club help us. Mm -hmm. And the second day we had a tournament there. Um, but that's our, the main fundraiser. And then we just, since we've had to go viral and virtual and um, online, we just did a, uh, an event called Home for the Holidays, which we got local chefs and they prepared a recipe and then they sent out uh, their page to all their friends and family. And um, that's been very successful too. Um, we're, you know, we're having to pivot to try new things because we can't have physical events. We're hoping this year, we usually our golf, the golf tournament um, is the end of February, but this year we pushed it back to April, dependent on COVID restrictions. So we're hoping right. we can still have it. But so far, all the chapters have come in on budget or actually a way above budget. Everyone's been so generous to donate even though they can't physically come to the events. Right. So um, we're just very, very fortunate that we have such loyal supporters. Our LA chapter, which was the first child help chapter, we have members in there that have been working for child help for over 45 years. Wow. And most of them 20, 30 years. That's very common. So we have a lot of people who have been supporting helping abused and neglected children for many, many years. And um, they're precious to us. They're precious to child help and to the children especially. Yes, it's been, it's just, uh, I just love uh, all the things that we do. Mm -hmm. How much did we raise on the golf tournament last year? Last year, we netted $331,000. Yes, <laughs> and that's with 36 golfers. Yeah, so, so it's not a cheap ride. <laughs> right, and then we have a, a dinner the night before right. where we raise a lot of money with our live auction and donations and things, but very, very generous people. and. You know, it's, it's, Sarah and Yvonne are the most amazing people because it, they appreciate every little thing that's done. It doesn't matter how large, how small the check is. If you're sealing envelopes to mail out invitations, they are so grateful. I mean, they, they, I, that's how I, I remember when I first started, I was a volunteer for seven years, and I said, what can I do? And they said, well, can you put stamps on all these envelopes? And I said, of course. <laughs> and then I got a thank you letter from them. And I thought, how precious is that, that they cared about me putting stamps on envelopes? And they've always maintained that same uh, philosophy and how they do things. They, they are so appreciative appreciative, sorry, of, of what everybody does, no matter how big, how small, it's whatever they can do, it's appreciated. It still contributes. Yeah. I just remember, um, I think it was last year, year before, I can't remember. Mm -hmm. um, I've worked several of the tournaments. Okay. I remember the first year I was serving drinks after they came off of the golf course. Uh, <laughs> and then I had to clean up really fast and jump on the bus or else I was going to be left up there. You know? right, right. <laughs> but it was just it was just so cool. It was uh, fun to see these people. And they, a lot of people come out year after year to yes, do this they too. Do. Some of them have been coming. Some people have been there all 10 years. Yeah, they come out every year. And it, it's not, like I said, it's, it's pricey. But you know that most they know that this money is going to help. But I just remember a couple of years ago when we were at the I call it the parents party, but the mm -hmm. party the night before, um, that we needed a new switch for the generator right. because all the kids um, the way our generator worked at the Beaumont facility yes. at, at Murph Griffith was that um, it wouldn't automatically turn on if the lights went out, and right. so. What people didn't understand was that these kids, when the lights go out, sometimes they have to have night lights and stuff because dark was when the bad happened, exactly. you know, and so they would just get terrified. Right. And so we actually raised, I think it was $25,000, raised the paddle and we, t we told them what it was in the first paddle up, 25000 you know, exactly. I mean, it's just amazing because, you know, with the, we still have to take care of the infrastructure. Exactly. And I know we put new carpet in some of the, co in our cottages, we call it our cottages, but 
um, you know, the cottages are only, how many kids are each cottage? I can't remember. Right Seven now there's about 12 to each cottage. Um, sometimes it's a little more, sometimes a little less, but we're at the village in Beaumont. We can have 84 children and we're full all the time. Yeah. Because these are the ones, like you said earlier, these are the ones that are, have been so severely abused or, mm -hmm. you know, I also call it wounded in the womb, right. where the parents was on drugs or alcohol or whatever, and you have fetal alcohol syndrome and all different kinds of things that go on with this. But these are the kids that you've tried and they've tried so many times to place them in a family environment right. and they just can't, they just can't, can't cope function. with it. Yeah. They just can't function. So it's that's why I think this is just so incredible because like you said before what they would do before something like this then they would just lock down and medicate right so we're just kind of like a step in between before exactly. going into that kind of a situation exactly. and it just you and know try to give them the specialized help they need right because that's what they need they need to retrain the um their brains so how they respond because many times their response is to run away or to fight or whatever it is. And so they're helping to retrain their reactions as how they deal with situations. Right. And then, um, but they also, you know, I've also heard stories that some of these kids, when they show up at the village, they have a garbage bag and that's their clothes, you know. And what we also do is that we try and give them new clothes. And a yes. lot of kids, when I remember, was it Barbara was telling, Barbara Geetson was saying that they gave a little girl a dress and it still had a tag on it. And she oh. didn't even know what that was. She had never had anything new in her life. Oh. And I, I remember Barbara telling me that. And I was like, oh my gosh. So it's not like we're just... Um, what we do is we just add, the, the cake is basically there by the state. The very simple necessities Basics, are there. Right. Yeah, and but what we do is we add the frosting exactly. a little bit to make it just... And like, the candles. And the candles, <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> That's great. Yes. Yeah, at our villages and in our foster care, um, we do not give the children even gently used clothes. Every child gets everything new because Sarah and Yvonne felt... They wanted these children treated just like their own children would be treated, and that that helps build their self-esteem again, that they're not just getting hand-me-downs or old clothes or, or used toys. Everything is new that these children are given, except for suitcases. That's the only thing we take donations in that are gently used because, like you said, sometimes they come with their clothes in a garbage bag. Sometimes they don't even come with that. They've been taken out of the home in the middle of the night and they don't even have that. And so during their stay at our village, they're, they, they have their holiday presents, they have their birthday presents, they have their clothes. They all get brand new holiday clothes, brand new Easter clothes. Um, and they take all those with them when they leave. So they need a suitcase by the time they leave. And that's the only thing we take in that's gently used. Yeah. Um, so they have something to take with right. them. But, um, I remember when we did um, Easter last year uh -huh. and Barbara had put all these little dresses with, they even had little purses exactly. and, and little matching and shoes and hats and gloves. Oh yeah. my gosh, it was adorable. Exactly. But, and you know, it's just, you know, sometimes just that little bit that little goodness and that kindness just just makes a huge difference with exactly. these kids. I mean, I've been out there before. I've been at some of the events and stuff, and um, these these kids are acting like normal, <laughs> running exactly. around, playing, screaming right. kids. Where you know, and there are still some though that you see that will kind of sit off by themselves, right. and they're still, but they're usually pretty new. Right. But they're still involved. Everybody's still involved. And we do, a, they do a Christmas program. I yes. mean, everything is just done such so nicely and so wonderful. And we recently did something on the freeway. Then you want yes. to tell us? Yes. That was well, so cool. <laughs> the chapter in Indian Wells, um, because we have the I ten freeway, they uh, with it from their members. They raised the money to put up a billboard with our 1-800-FOR-A-CHILD, which is our Child Help National um, Child Abuse Hotline. And because of that billboard, each week over 400,000 cars pass by there that see that number. Because that's what's most important, is to get that number out so children know 
the number to call. And so right. it is 1-800, the numeral four, and then a child. And um, that that billboard, we, we can't really track how many children it has helped, but we know people are seeing it. And right. we know there may be, they, the, a child might see it and then two months down the road need to call it. So we try to make it a very simple number for them to reach out to us. But yeah, that, that's very, very special of the Indian Wells chapter. And it's actually been up now over a year and a half because wow. We had it up for a year last year, and then we extended it during the summer, and now it's up until um, March, I March, think. March, yeah. yeah. That's what I think yeah. they said the last board right. meeting, yeah. So mm -hmm. at first, though, the guy that owns the sign, he was donating some of the, or he's giving us a break on it to do well, it, Well, they have it? a charity rate, uh -huh. um, and then during the summertime, Lamar Billboards actually gave us the billboard for a couple months free, which was very, very kind. Oh, wow. It's but so we do have a charity rate, and um, so we're grateful for that because, like I said, that's the advertising we want to get out to to everybody is that hotline number. Yeah, and so our, um, so Sarah and Avant, yeah. are they going to retire anytime <laughs> soon? I mean, I know I, they're really, they've been doing this since after, since 1959. Yeah, right after the war when they were overseas. Right. It was when Korean War was going on and right. they were over there with the USO, right? right. That's It's all in the clip that you yes. know, we just saw, but still, right. um, are they ever gonna retire? They've been doing this for a you know, long time. I, you know, when I think when you're given, given a, a mission in your life, they're 85 years old now, and honest to goodness, they are going stronger than ever. They were, I, I think they must work 20 hours a day because every I talk to them all the time and they're in Zoom meetings now and, and interviews and they're writing books and they're working with Congress and um, they just never stop because it's a passion that God put in their in their hearts right. and, and it keeps them young. It keeps me young. In fact, <laughs> when we used to travel together, the, there's another staff person that would come to and we go, we're exhausted and they're still up working and we're ready to go to sleep. I mean, they are, they are wonderful, wonderful examples of love and passion and leadership. Um, they've been nominated now nine times for the Nobel Peace Prize. They've been nominated for the Presidential Medal of Freedom for their work that they've done. Not only with children in this country, but for Vietnam and, and Japan and all over the world. Because when they started, there were no classes on how to work with abused children. So they just did it from their gut on how they treat their own children. And um, now, many other countries come and look at child help and see um, the practices that we do that have been successful so they can take it back to their countries. Yeah. So, there. I, I I am so blessed to work for these two wonderful <laughs> ladies. I, I I thank I thank God every day for it. Yes. You know, it's um, it's kind of like you know what, the way I got into child help is we were working at Safe House. Uh, oh. It's a, a secret place, and I never can tell. But mm -hmm. um, we were uh, when we graduated from uh, practitioner training at the center, we had to do some kind of a huge you know, thing. So the four of us that graduated decided to do it all together. Uh -huh. So we were going out to Safe House and we were doing like uh, baking cookies and, or, you know, just doing things with these kids that were there. And, and then it just sort of didn't work with them because they, they had a different agenda, I think, you know, because we'd show up and they wouldn't even know why we were there, you know. Uh -huh. And so, and then uh, I think it was Lori Hewling said, um, that uh, well, I want you to meet this lady. Remember we went to lunch? <laughs> right, she I brought all know. four of us to lunch and we're sitting she there did. and she said, I want you to meet this, this is a perfect <laughs> place for y'all. And so we all sat down and we all wrote our checks and we joined. But yes. you know, and then we then here you are, you know, the first meeting. It, it's just like but yeah. it's like everyone that is part of this chapter, everyone that works with this, just it's like they have this divine urge, exactly. like I call it to be there and to be a part of 
making a difference. Exactly. And that's exactly what this is. It's just making a difference in a child's life. Exactly. A child that would, you know, and, you know, there's no statistics to show that when you've helped a child, what the difference is. But I do know that a long time ago, I was doing a, a, a project and it was on, um, they had these kids that were part of, like, in Watts, mm -hmm. you know, and the most toxic environment you could imagine where, you know, their, their parents were one or two were in jail. Some were, you know, they were drug dealers. Mm -hmm. These kids were, you know, they were just so totally disenfranchised. And what they couldn't understand is every now and then you'd have one pop out that was going to college. And I mean, you, you could not even imagine how this was happening, you right. know? And so this one study I read, the one thing that they, you know, they went through and they, they did these studies on these kids, you know, or like, parent in jail, the other parent living with a grandparent, living with a relative, you know, or, you know, multiple brothers and sisters, not, or an absent father, whatever. But the one thing that made a difference was if one person believed right. in this child. Exactly. And it was, it could be a teacher, it could be a next door neighbor, it could be a grandparent, it could be, you know, but if one person believed in them, right. they could make it out. That's right. And it's just, so when you think about, I mean, how many kids have they helped now over the years? Oh, I think it's over 10 million children, uh, child help has touched their lives. Um, yes, because we have people that come back and tell us that those were the brightest memories of their childhood, uh, of their childhood, childhood when they were at child help. Right. Because they knew, they knew they were safe and they knew what to expect and they were getting the help they needed. Right. I remember having um, at some of the dinners that we had and testimonials of people right. that had actually been in this our facility right. and what a difference it made in their lives. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's just amazing how little it takes, really, if you look exactly. at the big picture, how little it takes to make a huge difference. Right. You know, it's going to be your time, your money, or, you know, whatever, you know, it, whatever you can give or whatever you can do. And I think most of the people in our chapter, man, we just... We bend over backwards to do whatever we need to do to get it to get it to work. You know, yes, and your group has been amazing too. I mean, they have been they CSI. Well, at the village, we have a holiday party every year, and they they do toy drives. They they will pick a special friend for the day if if they can't be a permanent special friend. They they donate. They um. Oh, so many things that, that CSL has done for child health, it's been phenomenal because even though our, our village is in Beaumont, we have chapters in Orange County and Los Angeles and it's, it's, it's a long drive for people to come and spend the day with a child and, and not a real long drive, but it takes a whole day. And so our community here in the desert has been so supportive because they're so much closer and CS CSL has been amazing to help with all that. So I really appreciate it. I, I remember once we had over 35 of our members exactly. that what the deal was, you, you took a toy for that day and you took right. a toy for under the tree. Right. And, you know, it was, it was between $35 to $50, something like that. And, um, I just had so much fun doing that. Right, right. Mimi and I, my <laughs> Mimi Nichols, who is part of the center, also right. we went shopping. We had to, and we had to find the perfect box to oh, put it in, and, you know. But it's just that one thing. It's just like it's that giving back right. that is so important. And I think that that's what the center is all exactly. about. We're all about giving back, yeah. you know, and being of service to our community and being responsible for our own lives and being, you know, and stepping out of our own self and you know right. giving back to other people right. which i see in you as well oh, i know that yeah. you have so much passion around this it's really been do. great i so. really do it's it's like my mission in life also I, it, it has become my mission is to make a difference in these children's lives it's and amazing the center for spiritual living has been a great help to us seriously i really really appreciate it well we appreciate you too oh, so you. appreciate all the work that you do thank you and so i think that we're just now at a good place to leave you guessing if you want more <laughs> yes, <sir. laughs> if you want more information um we'll have the number for child help on the bottom of the screen it'll be across the banner at the bottom 
and uh, or you can contact me, I'm, I'm Reverend Cheryl Guest, just contact the Center for Spiritual Living in Palm Desert. And if you have questions for Judy, I'll be glad to give them to her and forward it sure. to her and get, you know, whatever you do. Or if you want to join, okay. please don't hesitate because we, we, I mean, even though we do a lot of work and stuff, we still have a lot of fun too. Yes, we it's do. It's always laughter and full of joy because we're doing what, you know, our hearts are driven us to exactly. do. So well, thank you, Cheryl. Thank, thank you, you so much for thank being you. with me, and thank you for giving us all this great information about what's going on, you know, with you everything so that we're welcome. doing. Thank and you. so, with that, I would just like to say Happy New Year to everyone. And uh, if you want to join, come out and join us. <laughs>